In this talk, we're going to discuss the Haldane model, which is the first model that introduced the concept of topology. And we're going to cover a few different aspects of the Haldane model. So the first thing we are going to, to discuss and uh, to remind ourselves is the concept of Berry curvature, Berry phase, uh, specifically in the context of Dirac fermions. We are going to introduce the Alden model and solve it. And from that, we, uh, the concept of churn insulator is going to emerge. So let me start with a brief reminder of what is the Berry phase and the Berry curvature. So what Berry told us that in addition to the dynamic phase that any wave function has in quantum mechanics, if uh, we perform a trajectory in parameter space, any general parameter space, wave function can acquire an additional geometrical phase factor. Now this is uh, generic, we can choose any parameter space, but in fact it becomes extremely useful where we think of a specific parameter space in solid state, which is the space the, uh, of momenta, the Brillouin space, the Brillouin zone. So if we take a trajectory where we take the wave function uh, around this trajectory in K space, we can get a non-trivial geometrical phase. Uh, this phase, in fact, comes from a line integral over a vector potential. And this vector potential we call the Berry vector potential and we can obtain this Berry vector potential directly from the internal structure of the wave function, the non-Bloch part of the wave function, the U of k which we introduced in the first talk. So just by having a gradient in k space of U of k bracketed with U of k again, this gives us a vector potential. Good. Now just like uh, in usual electromagnetism, where we have vector potential, we can also get a, a field uh, which comes from the curl of the vector potential. So uh, in electromagnetism, we can, you can have a vector potential out of which you get a magnetic field, and this happens in real space. Here we get the same thing in K space. Berry vector potential is this, and the in the curl, uh, we, are, we are calling a Berry curvature. This is a local property now. It's defined for every k, just like magnetic field is defined in any point in space. So you can see that to get the Berry phase, we can equivalently integrate the Berry curvature over an area that this trajectory is uh, encircling. So we can do this for any trajectory that we pick in k-space and we'll get a phase. But there is one special trajectory that gives us an important quantity and this trajectory is going over the entire Brillouin zone. And if we integrate the Berry curvature over the entire Brillouin zone divided by 2 pi, we, get a, we must get an integer number we call this number the churn number, and this number is going to characterize our energy band. If it's zero, it's going to be a trivial band. If it's non-zero, this is going to be a band that carries topological properties. So this is generic for any solid, but now let's focus on how the Berry phase and Berry curvature look in the case of a massive Dirac Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian that we introduced in the first talk when we talked about uh, graphene. It's, uh, it's described by a D vector, uh, which is in our case, since it's Dirac, it's very simple. Its x component is kx, its y component is ky, and its z component is delta. This is the mass that opens a gap in the Dirac point. The solution is that, we covered it in the first talk, 
And now we can, using the formula that I showed in the previous slide, derive directly from this internal structure of the wave function, the pseudo spin, if you want, um, the vector potential. And here I present the vector potential for the upper band, A plus. You can see that at a given point in K, uh, its x component is Ky, its y component is minus Kx. So we see it, it behaves like a vector that whirlpools around the Dirac point. And the further you go away from the origin, from this factor, you can see that it decays. We can do the same thing for the other band, the minus band, we will get another whirlpool now going in the opposite direction. Okay? So this looks very simple, but in fact, if we do the curl of this, which is the local Berry curvature, we get something even simpler. This is this expression, or more explicitly, this expression. And this is exactly what you expect from a monopole at the Dirac point. So let, let's plot and see how it looks. So if these are the two bands of the massive Dirac point, um, the color here represent the local Berry curvature that we have. And you can see that the Berry curvature is focused on the place where the gap is open. Uh, it's strongest at the Dirac point, and as we go further and further out in K space, it, become, it becomes weaker and weaker. You can also see that it has opposite sign for the two bands. For one band it's plus, for the other band it's minus. So now we can ask what is the Berry phase um, that we will get if we'll go around the trajectory at a given radius k. Um, so, so this is what you'll get from this surface integral. And this is what is presented in this graph. So this is the Berry phase we will get if we go at a given radius k in each one of the bands, one, the, uh, the bottom band and the top band, normalized by pi and plotted as function of the radius of the circle that we take, normalized by the effective mass in our model. And you can see that if our, the radius that we take is, is small, then the Berry phase is zero. And this is very trivial. We're not encircling any Berry curvature. On the other hand, if we take a large radius, and large is compared to the scale of the effective mass. So if we take our radius far away, such that all the Berry curvature already decayed, and we're encircling the entire thing, you see that we are converging into a constant value. And this value is either pi or minus pi, for the two bands. So this is an important conclusion for massive Dirac point. If we are looking far enough away from the Dirac point, and far enough is on the scale of the effective mass, the a Dirac point has a, a Berry phase of pi or minus pi. So now, uh, if we look on how the Berry curvature uh, looks uh, for um, the actual graphene and not just the synthetic uh, Dirac point, this is how it looks. Uh, you can see that uh, it has an opposite sign for the K point and the K prime point, blue and red. Uh, what it means is that if we now integrate the Berry curvature over the entire band, let's say we pick this band, it would cancel out. The, the churn number would be exactly zero. Okay, so in graphene, the bands are trivial bands. And now we are going to add an ingredient that is going to make it more interesting, and that's what Haldane did. So we are going to start with the graphene model that we introduced in the first talk. So this is the Hamiltonian, again, nearest neighbor tunneling, a mass term delta. And now we are going to add another term, which is a second nearest neighbor tunneling term, which I'm marking here by this arrow. This is tunneling between these two atoms. And this is an imaginary tunneling. So in addition to the amplitude, which is uh, T2, we have a phase that is defined by E to the I phi. And the sign of this phase is marked by the direction of the arrow. 
So we are going to have this term, but also additional terms that takes us like this, with the phase going along this direction. So you can see that as we go around, we accumulate a phase. And this is exactly what will happen if an electron would tunnel between the site and there was a magnetic flux in the, in the center here. So you can see that the model introduces a magnetic flux that sits here, whose value is 3 phi. But uh, when we think of the electrons going around uh, another direction, we can see that in the other places here, we have a flux of minus phi. So, although there is something that behaves like a local magnetic field, um, overall this magnetic field is averaged to zero. So, at the end, this is a model that describes a system at a zero uh, average magnetic field. So, this is how the tunneling happens for one atom. Here it's the B atom. And the same, uh, and for the other atom, the other sublattice, we're going to have exactly the opposite tunneling in the model. Formally, we're going to write it like this as minus T2 uh, e to the i nu ij phi. And nu ij is just the sign of the cross product of two vectors, which are the vectors connecting the two atoms. So this means that. If we are turning left, we are going one phase. If we are turning right, we are getting the opposite phase. And we are going to have these tunnelings throughout the model. The important thing to notice is that this term that we added is a term that connects A atoms to A atoms and B atoms to B atoms. Which means that it's now a diagonal term it's going to sit on the diagonal of our 2 by 2 matrix. And this is something we didn't have in graphene. This is a term that behaves like a mass. But the important thing to understand is that unlike the conventional mask, you can see by the direction of the arrows here, that this term acts one way for the A atoms and the opposite way for the B atoms. And this is going to be uh, the crucial ingredient. So now uh, we introduce the model, let's uh, solve it uh, briefly. So the solution uh, would have the component that we had in the graphene solution. So the dx and dy part of the solution are going to look exactly like the, the one we had in conventional graphene. The term that Haldane introduced is going to affect the dz and dz part of the Hamiltonian. So how do we get um, the effect of these terms? What we need to do is to sum up all these tunneling that uh, electron can do from an A atom. So for example, we can have this tunneling along the A1 vector. It's going to uh, give us this phase e to the i k A1 and this extra phase of phi with a plus sign. But if we now go along the A2 direction, we are going to have this phase, but the, the phi with minus sign. And we need to account for all these arrows, uh, their mission conjugate, and if we sum all these terms, we can get something that looks rather simple. That's what you see here. Um, it, it has t2, sine phi, and some sum that you can see here. So this is generic. It works at any point in k-space, but to understand uh, the essence of this term, it's very instructive to look on it on two specific points, on the k point and the k prime point. So if we put here k or k prime, you can see that this term simplifies into just a coefficient t2 sine phi, but you can see that we have here plus minus that correspond to k and k prime. And this is what I mentioned earlier. This term gives you an opposite sign for the two valleys. This comes from the fact that we have two different terms for the A and B atoms. And this is very, very different than the conventional mass that have this, has the same sign for the two valleys. So if we, to, to see it more uh, graphically, let's plot this Halden term in k-space. 
this is what you see here and you can see that it's positive around the k, val, uh, k, k point, it's negative around the k prime point. So now let's try to understand the behavior of the model as function of its parameters. So we are going to look in the phase space of two parameters, the flux here divided by pi and the mass, the regular mass divided by T2, the amplitude of the second nearest neighbor hopping. And let's start from a simplest, the simplest case where flux equals zero. This is exactly the usual massive graphene that we know. So let's be at a point here, flux equals zero, but finite mass. This is the band structure that we already saw. You see that here we have compensated positive and, and negative Berry curvature, which means that the, the bands, this band and that band, have zero turn number. Now what happens if we start reducing the mass delta? Let's follow this line here. What happens is that the band gap closes. It closes and gradually we reach a Dirac point that and it reopens, we get another gap, and you saw that when it, it closed, the Berry curvature flipped. It was red and blue, and now it's blue and red. But since it flipped symmetrically for the two values, uh, values at this exactly the same time, at every point along this line, the sum of these two was zero. So at every point along this line, the churn number is zero. But now let's look on, let's break time reversal symmetry, introduce this uh, flux phi, and let's look, for example, what happens when our flux is minus pi over 2. So start with some effective, uh, finite effective mass. You can already see that it's slightly different. The valleys are now not symmetric. One is, uh, the gap is smaller, one the gap is bigger. But you can see, still see, if you look on the colors, that here it's blue, here it's red. Here it's more smeared, here it's more focused. But as I showed you, uh, the smearing doesn't really matter. If you integrate over this, uh, this is going to give us a, a berry phase of pi, minus pi. This is going to give us pi average together. This is going to give us a churn number for the entire band of zero. Now, let's see what happens if we start reducing the delta. So if we reduce it, what happens is that the gap closes, but now it happens first for the k-points. Here there is still a gap, and here the gap closed. And this closing happens along a line in phase space that looks like this. And as we cross this, this point, and the gap reopens, something interesting happens. Now the Berry curvature sign flipped on this k point, but it's still the same as it was in the k prime point. And now you see that the color of the Berry curvature in these two cases, the two k points, is the same. Which means that if we add them up, pi plus pi, or minus pi plus minus pi, is going to give us minus 2 pi. So the churn number is now going to be minus 1. And this churn number will exist all the way until the second gap and the k prime point closes. Once this happens, uh, and this happens along this line, uh, the Berry curvature would flip sign here, and then we're back to the situation where we have a churn number of zero. So you can see that what happens is that we go from a state where the churn number is zero to a state where the churn number is minus 1. And by time reversal symmetry, we are going to have a state here with churn number of plus 1. In the next talk, we are going to see why these states that have non-zero churn number, states that we call churn insulator, are interesting states topologically. Where one of the things we are going to see is that these states are going to have a non-zero quantized hole conductance. Very similar to the quantized hole conductance in units of E square over H that we get in the quantum hole effect. The 
only difference is that here we can get the same quantized hole conductance at zero magnetic field. And this is the interesting properties of topological insulator that we can get the same physics of the quantum hole effect, but now without needing of magnetic field.